So um, there's a bunch of electrophiles that an that a alpha carbon can attack. We won't have time to go through all of them, but the most interesting is to go back to the chapter 17 material. An alpha carbon can attack a carbonyl carbon. And that's the most confusing type of reaction because then we have two aldehydes or ketones in the same reaction. And that's basically the aldol condensation. So that's what we need to make sure that we're very comfortable with. So that's a very confusing and very important reaction. All right, so now we're going to go back to our, three, our four categories that we talked about before. Because again, we're going to be talking about attacking an aldehyde or a ketone. So basically, we're going to talk about how one aldehyde can attack another aldehyde, or how one ketone can, enact, can attack another ketone. Why is that possible? Well, because one of these is going to act like the electrophile, and one will act like the nucleophile. Who's going to be our electrophilic atom again? The carbon, alpha carbon. Who's going to be the electrophilic atom? Oh, electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And remember our notation. It's real helpful to asterisk the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. I really encourage you to, to keep doing that because these reactions are, are very confusing otherwise. So we know this is a good electrophile because it's delta positive. And who's going to be our nucleophile once we use our base? So it's also very helpful to label the alpha carbon. So that we're going to keep labeling the alpha carbon. Now I'm not going to label this alpha carbon because I'm not going to be using this alpha carbon as the nucleophile. And I'm not going to asterisk this carbonyl carbon, because I'm not going to be using this carbonyl carbon as the electrophile. So it helps this way we can distinguish between which molecule we're using as the nucleophile and which one we're using as the electrophile. We put the asterisks in for the electrophilic molecule, and I label the alpha carbon in the nucleophilic molecule. I'm not going to label this alpha carbon because it's not doing anything interesting, and I'm not going to label this carbonyl carbon because it's not doing anything interesting. So obviously, this carbon here is playing the role of this carbon here in our pattern. And who's going to play the role of the nucleophile? The carbon once we add yeah. some sex. Yeah, this alpha carbon over here. And then we need to ask, which category are we going to fall into over here? Well, it turns out there's another complication in the aldol reaction. It depends on whether you're doing it under hot or cold conditions. Mm -hmm. Under cold conditions, we get a category one reaction. That's right, you got it. Under cold conditions, we're going to stop with category one. And under hot conditions, we're going to stop with category three. So even though we're in a new chapter here, it's still very useful to think in terms of our categories here. Um, this should make the aldol condensation less confusing, because it really is just an extension of the reactions we saw last time. The only thing that makes it more confusing is it's confusing to have both a carbon nucleophile and a carbon electrophile. It makes it hard to keep the nucleophile and the electrophile straight in your mind. That's why it's so helpful to put in the asterisks and the uh, alphas. All right, so let's go through the reaction for this. Uh, I believe a common base that might be used here would be hydroxide. So um, let's say we put in some hydroxide. Uh, and let's show what our first step is going to be, mechanism-wise. Of course, it could be sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. No, that's good. So that's good. Let's stop and talk about this for a second. What is it that's stabilizing this negative charge? Resonance. Right. In fact, your instructor might have drawn the other resonance form where the negative charge is on this oxygen. But it will be simpler to leave it here, because this will be our nucleophile. And I'm going to keep labeling the alpha carbon in all the pictures. Uh, I didn't take this hydrogen, because this is not the alpha carbon I labeled. I took this one here. Let me point out another common mistake. I think it would be very tempting to maybe take this proton, because that's the one that was drawn originally. Remember, we're not taking the aldehyde proton we're taking the alpha proton. That's a common mistake. Because remember that when we originally drew the picture, if you use um, regular bond line notation, you don't even usually draw the alpha hydrogen. So it's very tempting to take the, the aldehyde hydrogen. 
As a general rule, I don't think the aldehyde hydrogen ever goes through any interesting reactions. It's drawn, but it's never going to be doing anything interesting. We should just ignore it. It's the alpha hydrogen here that's interesting, not the carbonyl hydrogen. Well, that took us to here. Uh, what would be a good logical next step? The negative carbonyl. Yeah. Now we can attack the asterisk carbon over here. Now, I'm going to follow the same pattern I did before. In chapter 17, I recommended putting the nucleophile on the same place as the carbonyl carbon to show that we've just replaced one of the former pi bonds with this bond over here. That shows that we're following the same pattern. So where there used to be two pi bond, a pi bond between the oxygen and this carbonyl carbon, now this nucleophile has come in and replaced it. And again, it's very helpful now to keep putting in our asterisks and our alpha symbols so we can keep track of who was the nucleophile and who was the electrophile. It doesn't look like a carbonyl carbon anymore, but it used to be the carbonyl carbon. Uh, so that was our step. That gets us to this picture over here. Basically, we're in this picture now. I think you guys already mentioned what would be a good logical next step. Um, it will get protonated yeah. in the H2O. Though. Yeah, we can just use the water from over here. We can't use, say, hydronium because we're doing this under basic conditions, so there won't be any hydronium. That's a common mistake. You have to use reagents that are consistent with the conditions. In these conditions, we have water and hydroxide. We don't have any hydronium. The aldol condensation, I should have mentioned, is only under basic conditions. I should have made a, a point of that before. Aldol condensation is only under basic conditions. We, we pretty much know why that is. What, why do we need to use a base to get the aldol condensation going? So we can deprotonate it and turn it into a yeah. nucleophile. Well. That's the only way to make the enolate in the first place. So it wouldn't make much sense to use acidic conditions here because we wouldn't get the enolate. All right, so now we can use this water that we generated in this step. But didn't we just see that you can get an enolate from acidic conditions? We saw that you can get an enol. Uh, we don't want to confuse enols and enolates. We saw that you can do keto enol tautomerization under acidic or basic conditions, but to get an enolate, you need to deprotonate the alpha carbon. Okay. Now, enols are somewhat nucleophilic, but they're not nearly as nucleophilic as enolates, so we wouldn't expect it to be able to do this aldol condensation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so. And so this was like the alpha beta hydroxy. Because they're connected by an alpha. Good. Let's keep putting in all our symbols here. Yeah, and you're asking what would be a good name for this. Um, now, we wouldn't want to call it alpha beta hydroxy, because that would be this, when there was a hydroxy on both the alpha and the beta. Well, we'll see that alpha beta idea in a second. You were thinking about something else. This would be a beta hydroxy aldehyde. Yeah. This is a beta hydroxy aldehyde. Or in other cases, it might be a beta hydroxy ketone, because we can also do the aldehyde condensation with a ketone. So here we have a beta hydroxy aldehyde. And in other situations, we could get a beta hydroxy ketone. Um, because now this is the beta carbon. It's also the former carbonyl carbon over here. So we should stop and talk about this for a second. Um, also, now we can see why this is called an aldol reaction. What does the term aldol come from? Aldehyde. That's right. It's called aldol because of this, this product over here, which has both an aldehyde and an alcohol. That's where that name aldol is coming from, both because we produce both an aldehyde and an alcohol. However, remember that this reaction could also work with ketones, and it's still called an aldol reaction, even though then you would not get an aldehyde, you'd get a ketone. So the naming is not all that logical. Um, it's still called an aldol reaction, even if we started with ketones. But then here it's very logical because it's called an aldol. Um, now, this is all reversible. These are all reversible steps over here. Maybe I should have used equilibrium arrows then. So this would be under cold conditions because it stops. If, it's, if we stop here, it would be under cold conditions. That's right. If we were going to stop with this, we'd have to do this under cold conditions. Even under hot conditions, we would get this as an intermediate, but then we would go through that. Um, so we can do that in a second. But let's stop and talk about this for a second. Um, so it's important to see then this is reversible, which means this is another hidden carbonyl. This is, um, so there's also, besides the aldol condensation, there's also the retroaldol. Have you, has your instructor used that term, retroaldol? Okay. 
That's a, a, an important reaction that many students don't get very comfortable with. They spend all their time on the forward aldol and they forget about the retro aldol condensation. So we know that if we start with these aldehydes, we can make them into this beta hydroxy aldehyde. But you should also know that if you start with the beta hydroxy aldehyde, you could zip back to two separate aldehydes over here because these are all reversible. So this really is a hidden carbonyl. I said before that hidden carbonyl is when you have a carbon with two bonds to electronegative atoms. But you can see that doesn't apply here. The better rule is it's when you have two bonds to atoms that could have been nucleophiles previously. So here we have this oxygen which can act like a nucleophile. And we know that the alpha carbon in an enolate can act like a nucleophile. So this is a, a harder to see hidden carbonyl. Basically what, what you need to do is you need to watch out for beta hydroxy aldehydes. If you see a beta hydroxy aldehyde you need to say, oh, I could do a retroaldol condensation on that. You just have to watch out for beta hydroxy aldehydes and ketones. And you have to say, gee, I know those can do retroaldol condensations. <laughs> Thanks. Because they're produced by a forward aldol condensation. 